What's going on, everybody? Welcome to Four Tires and Fuel. I am your co-host, Stephen Cherick. I am the rear tire changer on the 38 truck for Lane Riggs and Front Row Motorsports. And uh, I'm back after a week being gone. Sorry about that. But uh, <laughs> I'm John McGee, co-host of Four Tires and Fuel uh, with Stephen here, uh, front tire changer on the 41 Nice Motorsports truck driven by Bailey Curry. The 35 Xfinity car for Joey Gates Motorsports. And uh, at Daytona in this upcoming week, the 44 uh, Cup Series car for New York Racing, uh, driven by JJ Yaley. Yeah, awesome. So, Johnny, you were gone last week. I uh, I ran solo for the first time. It was uh, yeah. hopefully everybody enjoyed that one. And, uh, but yeah, so tell us about what happened with you at Daytona? We're going to touch on that a little bit because you did the cup race as well. So I kind of want to hear like, you know, what you saw difference wise between, you know, Xfinity and cup and stuff like that. Yeah. So, uh, the Xfinity race started a little bit chaotic. So we, I was originally on the 35 car driven by Akinori Ogata and he was caught up in a lap one crash and it completely destroyed the, Right front, the right front clip was bent in all the way, uh, huge gap, and uh, just the lower control arm and the tow link and everything was either bent or completely broken. So that was our race done on lap one. But the, 50, <laughs> the 53 had was kind of – they were going to run, try and run the whole race, but they didn't really have a full pit crew there. Um, yeah, you guys were actually – they were pitted right next to us, actually. Yeah, so the uh, competition director for Joe Gates asked if, you know, several of the guys from our crew would go over there and pit that car for the rest of the race. So we ended up pitting the 53 and uh, actually had a 20th place finish. So for us, that was a good good finish. Um, and then, yeah, the next day, actually, Joey. So Joey had uh, drove the 53 Xfinity car on uh, Saturday night and then on Sorry, on Friday night, and then on Saturday night, uh, he was driving uh, for his first uh, start in the next gen Cup car, um, the forty three car uh, for New York Racing, and um, yeah, so that was my first Cup Series race this year. Me and Steven did uh, several Cup Series races last year for the eighty four car driven by uh, Jimmy Johnson and Legacy Motor Club, but. This was uh, my first cup race of uh, 2024. And yeah, it was a super speedway. So uh, tires and fast pit stops didn't matter a whole lot, especially we were riding in the back all race too, trying to um, just save our stuff and be there at the end. So, but we obviously still want to go out and put on a performance and, you know, give as good a pit stops as you can. So, um, yeah, how it works a lot on the super speedway cars is the uh, front end of the car will be really uh, uh, tucked up under the fender there for some aero advantages. Um, and so it was uh, that way, but um, actually the right front in comparison to the 84 car that we pitted at Daytona last year uh, came out really fast, actually. So um, <laughs> it was not too much of a problem to pit the only problem was the left front was a little the droop was a little long so most of the time the, our jackman had to do a pump and a bump but that was just part of having the car um you know part of the super speedway setup and for speed and aero so um we're running again this week at atlanta and atlanta now after the repave is a very similar style of track with super speedway racing and uh drafting and uh you know pack racing so i suspect we'll have a pretty similar setup and a pretty similar pit strategy you're um, probably using the same exact car because you guys didn't even tear it up in the cup race where'd we you didn't. guys finish in that cup race i i know for a fact we're using the same car because we have one chassis so. <laughs> <laughs> we, are using it. We, are using it. we finished 20th which tied uh the team's best finish uh, i think greg biffle had uh a 20th place finish at atlanta in 2022 but yeah so that tied our the team's best overall finish we were really happy about that um you know the car came back with 
without a scratch on it, finished on the lead lap and obviously got a 20th place finish. So pit stops were, were good. Um, all things considered, the, you know, the, a little bit of the slower setup with the super speedway style, sometimes waiting on fuel, stuff like that. So, you know, I think we got the job done. Um, so, yeah, we're excited for Atlanta and excited for some more races coming up. Um, but definitely this week, we'll talk about it uh, a little bit more later in the podcast, um, as we always do when we preview the next week's track. But uh, I suspect a very similar setup and a you know, very similar pit strategy to, uh, to Daytona. So. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm glad, uh, I'm glad you got that opportunity. Uh, did you have cam Jack in that? Uh, I did, car? yeah. Yeah. Cameron Kowalski was our Jack man. Um, and so it was, a uh, a mixture of guys. Some, uh, our gas man, Zach Brown, that was his first ever cup race. Actually our, our front changer, or, sorry, our rear changer, um and our fueler uh were both that was their both their first cup races so um yeah they did really well and gained some experience and um yeah hopefully going to take that moving forward and um, yeah that's awesome see what we can do so you know yeah so uh so how did how did it it like fare difference difference wise on like the xfinity day versus cup day yeah, so, you know, generally pit strategy at a super speedway depend between the Xfinity and the cup cars are going to be about the same. Um, you know, it's either if you have to come down during a green flag stop, you're going to basically almost always just do fuel only unless it's like eight seconds worth of fuel and you can do right sides or something like that. But Pit strategy between the two is very similar, I would say, but with the cup race being longer. Um, but we actually didn't have to do any green flag stops because of some the way the cautions timed out. Yeah. But um, the difference is in pitting. So um, for five lug, uh, and we'll get some video here next week after I pull up the Atlanta and Daytona video, but Five lug, you're holding the gun sideways with the um, trigger in your right hand and your left hand is on the stock of the gun. Um, and uh, it's all really about uh, technique and accuracy. Whereas on single lug, you're actually switching your grip. So you're holding the trigger of the gun in your left hand and the stock of the gun in your right hand. And as soon as you engage, you're wanting to grab the rim at the same time as you're uh, grabbing the uh, trigger on the gun on the left uh, with your left hand to speed things up. So uh, that's a big change there for sure. Another big change is kind of in the choreography of the pit stop. So the way we do it for Xfinity is um, if it's a straight up stop, I'm going to leave, I'm going to pull the right front tire, but I'm going to leave it for my carrier to get if there is an adjustment i do roll my tire back to the pit wall but uh unless there's a left rear adjustment i'm going to go first in five lug to the left side left front and the jack man is going to come around me but in uh the cup series and um on any pit stop on the right side every single time depending doesn't matter what the there's an adjustment or not I'm uh, pulling the wheel, the tire, and I'm throwing it back to the wall and then tightening up the lug. And then I'm uh, kind of curving out and letting the jack man through every time. So uh, there's definitely some differences in the choreography of the pit stop. Um, and uh, that's definitely a, a change, you know, going from that's what we did a lot last year, going from five lug to single lug. And this week it was five lug to single lug back to five lug. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I, people always ask me, they're like, which one do you like more? I, I like them both. I think the same, you know, five lug is all about the changer and accuracy and speed and single lug is the whole stop is about speed and mistakes are uh, because the time is a lot shorter. Mistakes are uh, you have a lot less leeway for mistakes. And if you do make a mistake, it, you know, there's not a lot of ways to make up for it. So it's, um, you know, kind of perfection and, and just being on the absolute limit and speed for a single lug is um, compared to technique and accuracy um, for five lug are kind of 
they're different stops, but uh, both, you know, I, I, I know you feel the same way. I we like doing both of them. You know, so. Yeah. I, I mean, I love doing both, but, and, and, you know, Blake, my front changer on the, uh, the truck stuff, he, uh, he always asked me, he's like, I've never done a uh, single lug. I've never even held a single lug gun. And I'm like, dude, it weighs like twice as much of it as an Xfinity gun. And like probably three times as much as the clutch guns that we use in truck. Like it's, it's super heavy, but it's not about this, this, the hand speed anymore. It's all about just go in, hit that lug nut. And as long as you engage that lug nut, you know, the stop should be, should be pretty good. Yeah. So. There are a few other differences that I can, you know, forgot about, like for a Paoli uh, pit gun with five lug gun, Paoli also is the manufacturer for the single lug gun. But for a Paoli five lug gun, um, which I use for truck and Xfinity, I'm using, I'm running that at like 200 uh, PSI right around there. But for the cup gun, I'm running that at like 385. <laughs> um, so definitely a lot more PSI, definitely a lot more torque on those guns. And another point that Steven brought up is on five lug, you're kind of winding up the gun. You're pulling the trigger a second or so before you get to the, uh, to the lug nut. Um, and, uh, you're already having that socket spinning. So that first lug nut, you can just pop right off. But for single lug, you're not able to engage or pull the trigger until you're fully, uh, engaged with the lug nut. So those are the big differences that, um, in technique between the five and the single lug yeah and so how did it feel like how comfortable did you feel getting back into the swing of like a a single lug uh pit stop versus a five lug uh pit stop yeah you know i honestly hadn't done single lug practice in several months and uh i went over and was able to do some practices uh several weeks before and Honestly, I was a little worried about how I would do, but I felt pretty good. Like I picked it up, um, you know, better than I, than I thought I would. I think the muscle memory of doing it a lot last year helped a lot. So, um, yeah, and then going on race day, I knew that our objective was not to be the fastest pit crew on pit road, but to get the job done, um, you know, as best as we could, but also not to make any mistakes, to get wheels tight, not to have any penalties um and uh and get the car back on track and and uh and so that was uh you know a little relieving knowing that okay we're not gonna have to run eight second stops my, my first time back um in in a year so <laughs> knowing knowing what the job was and the objective and it's going to be the same this week in atlanta is um you know it, i think all in all it was a uh, pretty smooth transition or about as smooth as I could have uh, imagined. So I was, I was happy about that. Yeah. That's awesome. I'm glad, you know, you didn't, you didn't feel like you had any hiccups and you weren't like, Oh man, am I going to drop a lug nut? Am I going to mess up or whatever? Like, you know, you didn't have any nerves like that. That's awesome. Yeah. Definitely had nerves the first um, <laughs> stop because I was, I mean, you're always too, but uh, we paint lines on our socket to, so we can see it stop and uh for whatever reason i don't know why i get this way too in five legs sometimes i'm always like after a stop i'm like did i get all of them tight i'm always worried that i don't know why it's second i second guess myself sometimes um i have that issue too in five leg i'm like uh I did it at Milwaukee. Like we finished the second stop and I was like, I had to go back and hit the first lug nut again. Cause it didn't suck the wheel up all the way the first time. And I was like, did I get that wheel all the way tight? And like, I went back and looked at the film and I was like, all right, it's tight. Yeah, we're good. Yeah. yeah so that, that kind of gets magnified in single lug, obviously, because there's no safety net, like in five lug, if you get four tight, or even if you get three tight, like depending at the track, depending on what corner it's on on the, on the car it um will be okay but in single leg if, obviously if something happens you don't get it up tight uh tight then that's a big big deal so um there was a little bit of that in my head even though i saw the socket stop <laughs> I, went, I went back i knew i had it tight i stayed on a little longer than i needed to uh but that was really the big thing i was like man i haven't done this in a little bit i was like i need to make sure i 
there was a, some second guessing, but <laughs> you know, it's at Daytona once you get up on track and run a lap or two, it's like okay, it's good, you know. So um, yeah, that's awesome. But uh, just kind of for reference, uh, my wife was thankful enough to bring me this lug nut. So I have a five lug lug mm -hmm. nut, and you're, there's five of these on the car, and this is how big it is. <laughs> This is a single lug lug nut. Yeah. Like this is an actual one-to-one -one comparison. Like I can fit like 20 of these around this <laughs> lug nut. So like yeah. <laughs> you have to be super accurate to hit these. You just got to engage to hit this. Like right. this is what it looks like. The, the pins go into these little holes and it's got this, this ring around it and it grabs onto it with a magnet. And it pulls it out and stays locked into the gun. So that way you don't drop it. You don't have to change it out there. You don't pre glue the, these onto the new one, like anything like that. It's just, this is what we got. And you use yeah. the same one, the whole race. So hopefully you don't drop it on the ground. Cause I, I heard they're pretty expensive. <laughs> one thing uh, to mention about that. So our rear changer was a, a development guy at Penske and we were putting right next to the um, two car. And uh, so Penske guys were kind of helping them out. They had a lug nut uh, attached to like a, a, a pulley kind of thing. And it was, I'd never seen this before, but they would put that lug nut in the gun and they would pull it up and it would measure how much foot pounds of uh, force was required uh to pull it out which was really cool so is that were, to make sure the magnets were working yeah 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 so um that's wild and they had some other things too they had these little like shims that they would put in the gun uh and it would like i guess better seal the uh like the o-ring and uh it would like increase the, the pull force on it so that was what? Yeah, yeah. that's wild i know i'd never seen that before so um yeah that was they they said they wanted like a good magnet or a good seal was like thirty foot pounds of, of force, like per I think it's thirty, yeah thirty foot pounds, um, and which uh, is not a lot by the way. That's that like I think you can like the average person can like pull. I I think like when you twist off like a, a um, soda bottle cap for the first time, it's like probably close to thirty five foot pounds. So we uh. We had um, ours was like pulling at like fifteen to twenty, so I, I didn't use one, but our rear tender put a like a shim in and it put it to like thirty, so um, it worked pretty well. That's pretty awesome. I didn't know about that. That's uh, you learn something new every day. Look at that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, I yeah, like I said, I didn't know about that either. So uh, yeah. So, go. uh, so how did your race go at Milwaukee? Cause, uh, I gave my explanation of everything and we're still, we're, yeah. we're kind of touching on Daytona. So we might as well touch on Milwaukee. Yeah. First of all, Steven, congratulations on your win. Oh, that thank you. Awesome. I appreciate it. We talked <laughs> earlier in the podcast after I won at Darlington, I said, I know you have one coming. So <laughs> that's awesome. You got one. I didn't think it was going to happen there. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> yeah. You must love Milwaukee. So I'm sure Steven mentioned it in last week's podcast, but he won last year at Milwaukee with Grand Infinger, so he's two for two at Milwaukee. I guess what? They're not racing there anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I will ever I will forever be a hundred percent at Milwaukee. <laughs> That's right. So yeah. Um anyways, it was uh not the best luck for us, unfortunately. Uh we had a flat tire a left front get cut down like eight laps into the race and uh had to do damage control after that. Um, and uh, the left side of the truck was really, really low. So every time we did a pit stop on the left side, we had to pull up on the uh, left left side to get the jack under. So Even after like a full fuel run? Yeah. Or like so, a full stage? Yep. So That sucks. Yeah, it was a little low, unfortunately. and uh, But we battled all day. We went three laps down because we had a flat and we had damage like it was not only fixing the flat but it was lifting up and then beating out the damage on the left front fender so we lost three laps uh we gained a few of them back but we were behind the eight ball every uh for the rest of the race after that so um yeah 
that was it. I, another crazy thing too, is I'll mention. So I got a call. We landed, we uh, had a, so my schedule this weekend was a little crazy. We did the Xfinity race Friday in Daytona, stayed overnight, pitted the cup race on Saturday, flew back on a Stuart Haas plane to Concord airport. And I got in at like one in the morning. And then by the time I got home, maybe it was later than that. I think I got to bed at like two thirty or something. And then I had to wake up at eight for uh, to drive up to Statesville to fly um, on a chartered plane to Milwaukee. We landed. We left at ten thirty or eleven, and we got there at eleven thirty Central Time. And I uh, once we land, I get a text: "Hey, do you want to pit the? Uh, I need you to pit the Arca race." <laughs> Starts at noon. It landed at eleven thirty, and the track was like twenty five minutes from the track. The airport okay. was twenty five minutes from the track. So, <laughs> like as soon as just as if you can get there by the halfway point. So, we got there with like fifteen laps uh, after the green flag, and did a pit stop, and then immediately turned around and did the truck race. And uh, what yeah. car were you on for the? Uh, our car I was uh, on the uh, two car uh, Andres uh, Perez de Lara uh, Rev Racing. And we were running, I think we finished in fifth, but we were running like top three for the majority of the race. So, Yeah, he's a good driver. I pit for him earlier this year. Yep. So he's uh, winning the points, uh, I believe, or at least up into Milwaukee he was. So, um, That's leading, awesome. Leading the points in, in the ARCA. So, yeah, I know me and Steven have both pitted for Rev Racing in the ARCA series uh, this year. And, uh, yeah, it's a good program. And, uh, yeah. Love those guys. Yeah. Those, those guys that do the uh... – the Rev Arca stuff, don't they do that 44 uh, New York racing car? Yeah, they do. They do. So yeah, there that's a what I thought. Of, a lot of the guys who were doing that were uh, road crewing and, um, you know, working on mechanic crew for the um, for the uh, 44 Cup car. So uh, a lot of familiar faces. And my first ever crew chief in Xfinity, Mike Tizga, was the car chief on the 44 car. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> kind of... Uh, I, Did he remember you? Yeah, yeah. He, so Mike was actually at News Motorsports this year, and then he has since moved on to Joey Gay. So I've seen him all year, and, yeah, we have a lot of – Mike is a great guy. So uh, it was cool to have him on the uh, 44 Cup car as well. So That's awesome. It's, it's, see, it's always cool whenever, like, like, you know, you think of people higher up, like car chiefs, crew chiefs, spotters even, like – you know, uh, competition directors. We'll get to that a little bit later. Um, you know, those guys, they, they remember you and they're like, Oh yeah, you're so-and-so it's like, yeah, it's like, Oh dude, that's cool. I'm glad you remember me. Like it's, it's such a big sport, but it's such a small sport all at the same time. Yeah, definitely. I know. I can't tell you how many people me and Steven know on different teams that will come up and talk to them or they'll talk to us and, uh, you know, it's kind of like you work with somebody once or whatever, and then you know them, and then you see them, and then you say hi, and you know, it goes from there. And multiply that over all the teams or different crews or different, you know, teams you work for, and uh, you end up knowing a lot of people in the garage. So, dude, when I was at the uh, the race at Darlington this past weekend, I was sitting up in the stands with my son, and I'm looking down pit road, and I'm like, I think I know at least one person on every pit crew. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. No, nah, I, I, it's, uh, it's it's like that for sure. So so it's like, oh, this car won. It's like, oh, you know, I know it's Y and Z, you know, on that car. I'm happy for him and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, uh, so Stephen, uh, we'll kind of hit on Darlington a little bit. Uh, I was away uh, doing a Lamborghini Super Trofeo uh, race in, at Coda uh, this weekend. And Steven, you were in the stands watching the uh, Darlington Xfinity race. So if you want to briefly kind of touch on that. Uh, it was, uh, it was pretty straightforward race. I mean, uh, uh, it went by super quick. I think it was only like, it started at three 30 and at like six 30, we were walking to the car cause oh, it was wow. over. Like it was super short, only like two hours long. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was, uh. It started off really weird because uh, Parker Retzlaff had a uh, like some kind of mechanical problem where he's his car shut off on the initial start, and so he coasted around as far as he could and stopped in the middle of pit lane because he couldn't go any further. So the caution came out like on lap one, and uh, then like 
the 98 hit the wall and the nine hit the wall and the 51 hit the wall. And like, there were two other cars that had blown tires and stuff like that. Like all that stuff happened in like the first 10 laps. And then the race went green the rest of the way on besides the stages. So it was like, until like, I think three to go, the 16 blew a tire and hit the fence and the caution came out and it was a green, white checkered. But, uh, yeah, Christopher Bell dominated that race, deserved to win that race. Um, but Sheldon Creed had the better long run car and he was going to win that race. But, uh, you know, it was, it was pretty straightforward. Um, as far as that goes, as far as the Xfinity race goes, but, uh, but yeah, uh, the cup race was, <laughs> the cup race was very nerve wracking for me. Uh, cause since I work over at RFK, I was really pulling for Chris Busher and, yeah, you know, they didn't have the car uh, the car was way too tight is what I heard. And, uh, they couldn't get it to turn. They didn't have a long run car. They didn't have a short run car. And so they were kind of just playing the, we just need to be good enough race. And they were not good enough because Chris, chase briscoe won so yeah uh, it was an awesome yeah. it was awesome to follow along and i think the broadcast did a great job of covering all the storylines and you know with martin truex jr wrecking on lap two like <laughs> nobody expected that so you know there was that and um you know briscoe getting his first win of the season locking him into the playoffs uh you know the whole race they covered bubble wallace and uh Chris Busher and Ty Gibbs uh, and Ross Chastain, those guys uh, with their tight points battle. Um, and then I didn't know, but I guess Tyler Reddick was sick all weekend mm -hmm. and he was driving with like a stomach bug and he's like, yeah. you know, he was getting like Tums and antacids and stuff like that fed to him in the car as he's driving and, like, you know, he's battling for the regular season points title with Kyle Larson. And like, it was, it was cool to watch. It was, it, it was, uh, I think they did a great job covering everything that was going on that weekend. Cause there was a lot happening. <laughs> yeah. Do you like Lee Diffie? The, uh, I believe that's his name. The, uh, the commentator, uh, did a lot of IndyCar stuff and now has moved over to NASCAR the last couple of races. See, I, I'm kind of weird because it's like I love the way British people talk when they announce stuff. So, like, listening to him commentate the race, I love it. I think yeah. he does a phenomenal job. I think his energy is great. Yeah. Like, I can close my eyes and listen to him talk and know exactly what the heck he's talking about yeah. by the way he's describing everything. Right. And, you know, yeah. my wife – told me when we first met like i would listen to stuff on the radio and she's like how do you know what's going on and i'm like i can visually see it in my head and yeah. like those same vibes from him when i'm like listening to him and he just he does a good job he knows all of his stuff you know he does a lot of research he watches a lot of film yeah like, he knows what's going on and that's kind of what the sport needs is someone like that no, i agree i i i really like what he's done it's been a fresh perspective on the in the booth and uh yeah I, I really like it. i think he's done a great job so uh, i'm glad you feel the same way about that yeah i know there's i know it's very like i keep looking on like reddit and twitter or x or whatever and like it's it's so like mixed reviews on like a lot of people like him a lot of people don't and so like i yeah. i think he's doing a great job yeah i don't think they need to change that yeah no i agree well, do you want to hit on anything else at Darlington, or do you want to move on to uh, Atlanta coming up here? Uh, one of the things I noticed, that, just real quick, at Darlington was uh, uh, pit crew mistakes. Um, I don't think the 23 guys made a single mistake. If they did, it was very minuscule. Um, the five guys were very solid all race long. The 45 guys killed it all race long. Um, the 17 guys struggled. Um, and I heard that the six guys struggled really bad too, but it just goes to show that like when you put that immense pressure on those guys and like, you know, it, I know it, we've felt it before, you know, when you have to go out there and perform, even though you've done this job a thousand times, you've done a million pit stops in your career with practice and at the racetrack you still have that immense pressure and you feel it. 
Yeah. So it's like, it just goes to show that like, it truly is a team sport when it comes to NASCAR. And, yeah. you know, that's, that's one of the things I wanted to highlight was like, you know, it's, it's crazy how your whole weekend can be like decided on the pit crew. <laughs> definitely. 100%. I mean, it's definitely a team sport, you know, from all the way back to the engineers and R and D everything, you know, to the way the mechanics and the crew chief set up the car. And then on race day, obviously the pit crew is probably the biggest influence on the race other than uh, the driver, of course. So yeah, you're right. I mean, you can have everything go right. And then, you know, a late race pit stop goes wrong or something happens. And, uh, or especially in the single lug era, like you have a loose wheel or something and a wheel comes off, like that's your whole race done, you know, there. So yeah, obviously a lot of pressures on the pit crew, especially for those guys who are competing for a regular season championship or for the about four or five, six cars that were trying to fight their way in to get that, those last couple of spots in the playoffs. Um, it was uh, a, a high pressure situation all race. And uh, Darlington is one of those uh, tracks where tires are incredibly important and um, tire changers and pit stops really have a big uh, impact on the race. So um, yeah. Uh, yeah. It, it was, uh, it's, I didn't watch a ton of the race because I was at the airport flying back from Austin, uh, from Circuit of the Americas, but I did watch the last about 50 laps of it. And uh, yeah, yeah, it was uh, a lot of, a lot of moving parts all throughout, not only on pit road, but just the on the contract battle and everything like that. I thought was, uh, was really cool to see. Yeah. So uh, what did uh, anything interesting happen over with uh, the Lamborghini race? I yeah, mean, so, you were out there for like five days, weren't you? Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, I do a uh, uh, season. Uh, so far, I've done three race weekends. Uh, well, four race weekends total with IMSA, three with the Lamborghini Super Trofeo, and one with the IMSA Michelin Pilot Challenge. Um, and this weekend was uh, IMSA uh, Lamborghini Super Trofeo race at Circuit of the Americas. And uh, yeah, so normally our weekend for NASCAR is like, if we're only doing an Xfinity race, we'll fly the day of the race, get to the track about three, three and a half hours before the race, set everything up, blew our tires, pit the race, you know, get everything back to the hauler, and then we'll go right to the plane and, and get back. So sometimes it's not even a full day that we're at the track. But in IMSA, it's a lot different because you have a lot more stuff to unload. Um, like we had full tile floors and awnings and everything that we had to unload. Um, and then we had, so I got there on Wednesday, Thursday was our unload day and everything, getting everything set up. Uh, Friday, we had practice, two practices. Saturday, we had qualifying and a race. And then Sunday, we had another race. So you know, you're there over four days and three days of on-track action. So it's a lot longer days, a lot longer time commitment. But um, I enjoy doing that. I enjoy those guys over there and that type type of uh, racing with the sports car. It's definitely something different, a, a different world, a, kind of a different atmosphere than NASCAR. But um, a lot of actually our crew guys are former NASCAR guys or n currently NASCAR guys who – like me have a have a break so we had the race engineer for the 43 cup car at legacy motor club was over there the one of the mechanics on the 84 cup car uh was there uh former xfinity crew chiefs uh two of them were there and a former competition director at uh legacy motor club were all there uh and the team owner uh brandon godovic had driven in the Xfinity series and the ARCA, well, at that time, k &N series. So it's kind of cool being doing it all with NASCAR guys, but also racing sports cars and um, in a different format and stuff. So overall, it wasn't a great weekend for us. We just didn't really have the results that we wanted out of, we ran five Lamborghinis and two races. Our best performance was a P2 in class, um, but I think we would have just liked a little bit more performance all the way throughout, but um, yeah, so it went, went good. The only, probably the biggest hiccup was um, 
flight was delayed for about five five hours in Austin because of some weather in Charlotte. So that was not that ideal. sucks. That's um, terrible. One thirty in the morning, um, Monday morning. So yeah. <laughs> Did they have um at those those the the pit road setup? Is it the same as like the the IMSA stuff? That we pit where it had they have like those like hubs basically of like all the stuff out there. Yeah, so kind of talking about what Steven's uh talking about. Um, so the pit road setup in NASCAR, you're just bringing a pit box out there and you're only out there for a couple hours before the race and right after the race you tear it down. But these IMSA guys are there for like three or four days, so they have a whole setup on pit road. It has a massive pit box with all these computers and data points in fact a lot of teams will have two pit boxes and um they'll have these huge awnings and and uh tents and everything set up it's much more bigger it's a it's a much bigger setup and um but also you're cramming in a bunch of cars on pit road so you know you have multi-class racing and so sometimes you might have 60 cars where in nascar you're only having 40 40 cars max. So uh, it's everybody's like really, really tight in. I mean, your area is big, but you don't, it's the pit boxes themselves are a lot smaller than NASCAR. So um, yeah, yeah, that was, those are the kind of the big differences between IMSA setup and, and NASCAR. Um, but yeah, it's the same pit road that we use for um, the cup series or truck and Xfinity when we pit at Coda. Um, and uh so yes, I was used to it before. I'd been there, been there before, so kind of knew what to expect uh, when it came to that. So yeah, cool. That's uh, it's funny whenever like you go to these different like sports or series, I should say, and like it's like the concept is the same of just like put tires on the car yeah. as fast as you can, but like the 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 behind the scenes stuff is like completely different. <laughs> Yeah, and IMSA has different rules about who's allowed over the wall, what kind of equipment you can use, stuff like that. Like there's air jacks instead of a mechanical jack that lifts all four tires up at the same time. So you're right. It's the same idea, the same, you know, it, it gets done, the, uh, but it gets done a different way. So it's always kind of cool going into their world and seeing how they do things. And uh, yeah, so seeing what you can learn from them, seeing if you can teach them anything from NASCAR. And, uh, so, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so yeah, so that's, that's where Johnny was at. That's why he couldn't uh, spend some time with us. Yeah. But, uh, but yeah, no, it's, it's always fun to hear about like the different things that we do on the side. Yeah. So you want to move into a little Atlanta preview? Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about Atlanta. The, uh, there's another super speedway race. Uh, big drafting track. Um, I've noticed that like in the cup series, it's like they, they kind of stay more compact where it's like two lines of cars all the way throughout the field. And sometimes they go three wide, but like the Xfinity series always like opens up where you have like a line of like 10 cars that are single file. And then there's a huge gap. And then there's like, you know, six cars, single file. And then like they, they kind of break up into their own little packs rather than like stay together in the cup series. And I think that kind of makes for a little different strategy as far as uh, who you're going to pit with when you're going to pit kind of stuff. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I think um, the Xfinity series largely has been single file. I know sometimes they do get strung out like 20 cars wide, but you're right. They do break up and are in their own little packs and stuff, but mainly single wide uh, racing for the Xfinity series late in the race. They'll go too wide. Um, or, you know, after restarts and stuff, it'll stay too wide for a little bit. But, uh, yeah, the Cup Series has been much more consistent in kind of the traditional um, super speedway drafting that we are used to, like two two lines and, you know, pretty close. And you know, sometimes I'll even open it up to a third line. So, um, you know, I think our strategy for the 44 car and even the next Xfinity is going to be the same, you know, largely – uh, especially since the repave they did uh, three years ago, it's not going to be an emphasis on tires, um, mainly on fuel. 
and getting it full and so uh doing a full fuel run and um and that's really really important at these super speedway tracks or these super speedway um or these i should say drafting tracks <laughs> yeah we can't call them super speedways anymore <laughs> i guess atlanta is technically an intermediate uh but it's has racing like a super speedway so uh the emphasis will not be on us uh as tire changers this week i think in the Xfinity series will do a lot of uh, two tire stops, mainly right sides. It wouldn't surprise me if we do right sides and left sides or right sides and four tires. And um, yeah, I think we did several of those stops in the truck series race earlier this year at Atlanta. Yep. So that's kind of what I'm expecting for pit strategy. Um, yeah. What, what do you think, Steven? Uh, I think the biggest thing, especially for like, well, I'm not going to be there, unfortunately. Um, but for you guys and like us on pit road is basically like the biggest thing is just don't don't make a mistake because this pit road is one of the most unique pit roads because it starts on the back stretch like they enter to enter pit road the entrance to pit road is in turn three and they have to run they can run no faster than 90 miles an hour through turn three and four and then when they actually get to the front stretch where like the pit boxes start, it drops to 45 or 55. I think it is. But if you have a tire penalty, if you're speeding, if you have to come back down pit road for whatever reason, it kills your whole race because you have to spend so much time on pit road. Like, I think this, this boils out to like the, the longest pit road out of any circuit, just because of how far, they have to start because they have to start on the backstretch. Yeah, that's a really good point. You know, a race probably is not going to be won by a pit stop in Atlanta, <laughs> but it can definitely be lost for sure. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, which is different because, you know, like at Darlington, you could easily, you know, in the right situation, you could win a race off of a pit stop. But in Atlanta, Less so because of track position is less important in the super speedway race, uh, a drafting style race. And um, especially if you make a mistake, uh, don't get a lug tight or have a loose wheel or don't get it all the way full, for example, or have, yeah, like a pit road penalty. Uh, it, especially under green flag, it can kill your race. Under caution, yeah, it's not ideal, but under green flag conditions, you have to be really really on your on your game to just not necessarily have a fast you don't even have to have a fast pit stop you just have to have a clean pit stop penalty yeah pit stop, so yeah well that was the thing too like the the earlier this year when they ran atlanta i think it was the second race of the year it had one of the craziest finishes because yeah all of the fords we're on the same fuel strategy and they all ran out at, at the exact same time. They thought they were going to make it to the end and then they all ran out and like, you know, the 39 Orion C ran out, uh, the, the double zero Cole Custer ran out the 15 yeah. when Haley Deegan was driving, it ran out like everybody at the exact same time was just like, Hey, we're out of fuel. And they were like, Oh, well, I guess we were closer than we thought. Like, <laughs> yeah. No, so one thing that, Stephen, you bring up a good point at these super speedway tracks or drafting tracks at Daytona, Talladega, Atlanta now, under green flag uh, stops, if, you know, a fuel run has to happen during a, uh, you know, a fuel run runs through and you have to split it up in the middle of the stage, you come down during green flags. A lot of times you're getting manufacturer orders that say, okay, Hey, we're a Chevy. We're going to pit. All Chevys are going to pit on lap 75, for example. And they do that because all of the Chevys will then come out ideally at the same time and they'll be able to draft with each other and really have a, a strong, um, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll run well if they have a lot of cars drafting each other. Ford will do the same thing. Toyota will do the same thing. Lately, the Toyotas kind of had to have some weird strategy because there haven't been a ton of Toyotas. But I think in the Cup Series now, there's enough that uh, that, that they might be able to have their own pit strategy um, or 
the very least, sometimes Toyotas will blend in with another manufacturer. So, yeah, I know, I know Chevy like is like it's heavily favored in Chevrolet's uh, manufacturer side. Yeah, and so like usually it's like the Fords and the Toyotas will pit together, or sometimes the Toyotas will like split up, and some of them will pit with Chevy, and some of them will pit with with Ford. But I know for sure, like outside of in the Xfinity series, outside of the Gibbs cars, the four Gibbs cars, I don't think there's like anybody, any any other Toyota that's worth. Yeah, Sam Hunt is pretty good, but that's. Yeah, really about it. But that's one car. So, you know, that's like three. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I I think if you get like five or six cars in a line, you could probably be fast here just because it is such a small track. But if you ideally want that, like. Right around 10 cars is probably ideal to have together in a pack. So one thing we'll talk about here, if you're coming down a green flag stop and Atlanta, the most important thing is that you maintain the draft. If you lose the draft, if say you come down with Chevys, like we'll be pitting uh, the 44 car. Say we come down with Chevy, we're towards the back because that's probably going to be our strategy. If something happens and we lose the draft and there's 15 cars that take off and we're behind them, it, is over with that's the worst case scenario on pit road is you're going to lose a lap um or you're going to be detached from all your manufacturer help and other manufacturers are not inclined to work with you necessarily and so that can be game over for you um so you know a lot of times if you're doing a green flag stop it's really only going to be fuel only just because keeping that draft is so important if there was to be a mess up with the tires or it was going to take an extra second a lot of crew chiefs don't want to take that risk so during green flag a lot of it is on the fuelers and a lot of it is getting out you don't have to be you can even lose spots on pit road you can come down first and leave middle and or come down middle and leave towards the back but you just can't lose the draft when it comes to that so yeah you don't ever want to be that last car off pit road because even if you have a good stop if if you don't get hooked up fast enough, like off pit road clean enough, you could have a good stop, but you still lose the draft just because all those other cars are gonna get together faster and they're not waiting for you. They're they're just they're getting together and they're going. Like that you don't have time to be like, oh, you know, you know, Joey Gase in the 44 is hanging back. We need to go get him. Like, nah, screw him. We're going. <laughs> like, <laughs> Yeah, they're not going to mess up the strategy for 15 Chevys for one Chevy that's lagging behind. They're going to say. Yep. He'll yeah. figure it out. <laughs> so, but, I mean, you saw that at Daytona. We lost the draft in the first stage, and we went an entire lap down because we were running about four seconds slower a lap just not being in the draft. Um, We were running full throttle and both, you know, wide open the whole time in both situations. But just the way the draft is, you're you're just carried along and you're bumping the person in front of you. And it's like a chain reaction. Everybody's going forward. But when you lose the draft and you're by yourself, it's detrimental. (laughs) It's huge. You can't even put it in words. Yeah, like I said, we, we lost four seconds a lap from being in the, in the draft to not being we were running 56 second laps in the draft like 5607 56 flats and then we were running like 59 something out of yeah that sounds about right yeah and i know it's and that's completely flip-flop to the way it was in the daytona 500 because i know aj allmendinger at the daytona 500 lost the draft and he was running he was running two seconds a lap faster than the pack because the pack was trying to save fuel and AJ Allmendinger was just hammered down. So he was actually running faster than the pack was. And yeah, it's stupid stuff like that that just yeah. irritates yep. me. Yeah. So we'll see how Atlanta goes. Um, it's like I said, largely going to be very similar to Daytona strategy. But one thing I want to talk about, Stephen, is Atlanta pit road. What do, what comes to mind when you talk about when you think about Atlanta's pit road, other than what we talked about earlier in the uh, mm. intro? Ah, I mean, it's usually Atlanta's got like, they're not super big boxes, but they're not small either. They're kind of like, 
middle of the road sized, but they're uh, they're kind of they're a little more narrow than normal. And I mean, I usually never have have an issue with those pit roads. Um, I've noticed recently they can get kind of sandy with all the speedy dry that that lays down with all the big wrecks. But other than that, I mean, I really don't think there's that much of a um anything to talk about on that. Yeah, I've never had an issue with it. I know some guys complain that for tracks with the high pit road speed, like Daytona, Talladega, you know, those type of tracks, Pocono, Michigan, Indy, like uh, Atlanta is kind of that speed, a little bit, maybe a little bit under, like five miles an hour under, but the, the pit road is a little bit more narrow. The boxes are a little bit more narrow and, and definitely shorter than Daytona and Talladega. So I know there are have been guys who have gotten hit uh out on pit road in atlanta because of that so but i like i said i've never really had an issue with it yeah but it was weird too because when we went to milwaukee last week that or a couple weeks ago they uh they repaved the pit road for milwaukee and pit road speed limit was 55 miles an hour yeah so milwaukee (laughs) was crazy because last year it was like one of the worst pit roads it was like big cracks everywhere it was (laughs) it just was not very there was like a like a lip between the actual pit road and then the, the running surface, like the pit stalls and then the running surface. But they repaved it. It looked really, really nice, actually. Yeah, it looks great with 30,000 lines painted on the ground. I couldn't, yeah. I, I looked out there and I said, which line is ours? Because they had like the IMSA boxes and the cup boxes or the yeah. NASCAR boxes all marked as one. And I'm like, what the heck is this? Yeah, it was confusing. It wasn't really marked out very well. The NASCAR boxes were orange and the uh, Indy box, Indy car boxes were white. And so it was like, what? Where am I supposed to pit? But uh, yeah, so. <laughs> Uh, one thing, if we're done with, uh, you have anything you want to finish up with that on Atlanta? No, I mean, I, I just expect, uh, don't, okay. Don't expect the, the fantastic finish that happened earlier this year. The three wide, crazy Daniel Suarez winning finish. It's not, I don't think it's going to be that way. I think that was perfect case scenario you know, perfect situation kind of thing. I think it's going to be, um, it's playoff time. So you've got guys that are points racing. You've got guys that are racing for wins. You've got guys that are trying to just, you know, survive the race kind of thing. Everybody that's not in the playoffs is just make it to the, you know, end of the end of the race. So you're trying to just, you're, you're going to have a whole bunch of different strategies playing out as far as like what people want to do. So, it's not going to be the same as it was earlier this year where everybody's like, Oh, we got to get a win. Got to get a win. Um, so don't expect that. That was very high bar that they set, but I expect it to just be, you know, a lot of give and take in the beginning. And then as the race winds down, you might see a couple of big wrecks, but I don't really think it's going to be anything like there might be a good finish, but I don't think it's going to be like that crazy finish that we had last year. Yeah. I or earlier it, this year. I think there's going to be a lot more of uh, teammates helping other teammates. And uh, I think there's going to be a lot of the team game being played, a lot of the manufacturer game being played. And so you're, you're, I think you're going to see that more than you did earlier in the year at the uh, Atlanta race in February. I think it was. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, well, with that, uh, one thing I did want to talk about was the 2025 uh, NASCAR uh, truck Xfinity and Cup Series schedules got released. Yes, uh, they did. So I wanted to briefly talk on that. There are some changes for sure. On, um, oh, Stephen, I'll let you go ahead and uh, what are your overall thoughts and impressions about the new schedules across the three series and uh, anything in particular you want to highlight? I hate the fact that we're going to Bowman gray for the clash. I'm not a fan of that. Do I think it needs to be closer to home? Yes. You know, it used to be in Daytona. That was fine. It went to LA, you know, it was a hit the first time. And then it kind of, yeah, I did that race race last year. Yeah. This year, actually. (laughs) This year. And, uh, yeah, you know, it, it, it just, it was a flash in the pan kind of thing. Yeah, I, but I don't think Bowman Gray's the answer. 
I don't think I don't think we need to go to Bowman Gray. Um, so I'm not a fan of that. Um, going to Mexico, I'm kind of excited about that because um, when I heard about it the first time, I heard it was just Cup, and then I found out when the schedule released that it was Cup and X- and Xfinity going. So I was like, oh, cool, we get to go to Mexico. I got to get a passport. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so uh, I like that. I absolutely love the truck schedule. Yeah. They added Michigan. They added uh, New Hampshire. New Hampshire. They added the Roval. They yeah. added Lime Rock. And they added Rockingham to the schedule. Yeah, like, awesome. mind blown for all awesome. of that. Yeah, I'm really pumped with it, I think. And they added Watkins Glen, I think, too. Did they not? Yes, they put Watkins Glen back in the schedule. So there's three road courses for the uh, for the truck series, which I think is awesome. I think if you're billing the truck series as a developmental series, then I think you need to have more road courses. Um, I'm well, they also upped it too. Like this year, it was 19 races, and next year's like 23. I think it's or, yeah, t- yeah, 23 or 25, something like that. Yeah. Like they added like six more races to their schedule, which is awesome i think the truck series needs more schedule or more scheduled races yeah i i agree man i i'm super excited for rockingham i think that's gonna be awesome uh you have won a race at rockingham you're one for one at, for rockingham too yes uh, i am i i won in the uh the um the late models with uh brody kostecki back at, when i was uh road crewing for them back in like 2013 so I'm super excited for that. Um, it's a track that has a lot of history. It's like North Wilkesboro has been gone for a long time and really, really excited to bring it back. I think they repaved they, it too. They did. They repaved it. I've just heard a lot of great things. I, I hope we have an amazing crowd there. And uh, I hope that uh, the racing is really well. It does really well there. And we can go back for many years, just like North Wilkesboro, I think has been a hit. Uh, it's been really well attended, and I think overall the racing, especially in the truck series, has been really, really good there. So um, I'm I'm really excited for that. Uh, Rockingham's going to be awesome. The only thing that stinks about it is Cup only has one off week, and the Rockingham for the five load crews is that one week. So uh, yeah, we don't get a break. <laughs> we don't get a break next year. But Mexico City is going to be awesome. Uh, so earlier I talked about doing the clash at LA this year. I went out and uh, worked for a NASCAR Mexico series team and a driver, Coque de la Parra, who just won the NASCAR, uh, finished the NASCAR challenge series, their version of the Xfinity series, uh, regular season championship. uh, He's been killing it this year. So as soon as news broke, I talked to him and he's going to run the, um, the uh, NASCAR Mexico series race there on Friday and then really wants to get in an Xfinity car and run there. And I think he would kill it there. So looking to actually get him hooked up with an Xfinity team. And But definitely, I think I'm going to go down there the whole week, hang out with him. Going to do the uh, Mexico Series race on Friday. Going to do the uh, Xfinity race on Saturday there at the very least. So really, really excited about that. It'll, it's at the Formula One track. I, I think it'll be really awesome. And then... Um, yeah, the uh, the other thing, Lime Rock um, is an amazing addition for me um, to the schedule. You know, racing up in Connecticut, up in the Northeast, I think is an added bonus. Uh, that track is, is super fast. It's narrow. It's a lot of fun to drive. I know a lot of people have a lot of fun with it on the sim. Um, I think it'll be I know awesome. it has, it also has multiple configurations, so I'm, I'm, kind of curious to see what configuration they run yeah um because yeah. they have a spot on the back and the back half of the track where they can you can run the chicane mm-hmm. or you can skip the chicane and then it's just a sweeping right hander that leads to an to uphill and it's like either way it's going to be super difficult and i just i'm I'd like to see him run the chicanes but i'd like to see them not so it's like <laughs> i'm just excited to, ha- to be able to go there yeah the, like a the candy store man Right. No, I agree. It's always cool to have these new tracks. And I think NASCAR did a great job with adding uh, three new tracks um, across the series. Um, one thing is, so that race at Lime Rock is a Saturday. 
So same day as a cup race, but the day before, the day after an Xfinity race. So I'm really hoping that we'll be able to get up there and uh, pit that uh, race at Lime Rock. That would be awesome. I think even if we can't, I'm going to try to figure out how to get in there. <laughs> no, I, I really, I think definitely awesome. I know a lot of uh, truck teams, just like ARCA teams, will be looking for somebody to help, you know, change tires if, if there's an emergency or if there's a flat tire or something like that. So I think it's definitely a possibility to get up there and, uh, and, and do that race, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's the dude. The next schedule, next year's schedule, like, like I said, for the truck series, it's going to be so awesome. Like, we're, yeah. uh, me and my family are actually camping out uh, for the Roval this year. Nice. And then when I found out that we're, um, we're camping in the infield. And when I found out that, that the truck series was added to the Roval, I was like, Oh man, that is awesome. Yeah. Now, only, not only do we get to camp for the, uh, Xfinity and the cup race, but now we can see the truck race too. Yeah, like, awesome. Oh man, it's going to be so awesome. It's be really cool. Yeah. Yeah. The truck series and the Xfinity series for me is like some of the best. I mean, yeah, I, I think it's great. I think we should look to add more tracks. I think, you know, I, I would like to see Kentucky back on the schedule. I've never been there, but I think with the way that the next gen cars race really well at intermediates, I think that would be a good addition. Um, but even, even so I'm, I'm really happy with the schedule, really happy to have the cup series go to Mexico city and the Xfinity series too. And then obviously Rockingham and Lime Rock, I think are going to be really, really cool. So, Oh, one of the things I heard for the cup series well actually this is for all three series but it really pertains to the cup series um so if you looked at the schedule for the cup series they race it like at homestead like the seventh race of the year mm -hmm. and i heard a couple of rumors that they're racing homestead they moved homestead up to race it like super early in the schedule so that way they can repave homestead and then try to get Homestead to be the championship race again oh, wow. back in 2026. Wow. Yeah, that'd be great. I, I know there's a lot of memories of epic battles for the championship at Homestead. And it's such an awesome track because it can run so many lines there. And it's like a very, very – it's a driver's track running that high line and just hugging the wall the whole time around the track is – now, I like Phoenix. I think Phoenix is unique. It's a cool track, but I don't think if you're running that track as a finale, I don't think it should have two dates, you know? That's just my opinion. I think so, too, but I I liked Phoenix before they moved the start-finish line. When they repaved it and moved the start-finish line to that, like, just out of turn four, like, that's what I think ruined – phoenix for me because basically on the initial start you're not even take you're you're not even taking the racetrack you're all the way down on the apron as close to the pit wall as you can go when yeah. you take the green yeah. like I, I i think they should have left the grass there or put up a, the pit wall to, to to extend out further like do something because i don't like i don't like the fact that like as soon as you take the green and you cross the start finish line you're five wide Formula One fans are losing their mind when they see all the track limit violations. <laughs> <laughs> <a> penalty. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think there's definitely room in the schedule. Like, you know, Phoenix have one race a year. Well, right? what do you think about uh, them taking the one Richmond date? Like, oh. Richmond only has one race next year for uh, for the Mexico race. Fine with me. Richmond yeah. has not been very well attended. The racing is mediocre. Of all the short tracks, I would say it's probably the worst racing. Unless you're Austin Dillon. Yeah. And <laughs> I just, overall, if I had to rate my least favorite NASCAR track, it would be Richmond. I don't know why. It's just mid. It's just like everything about it is like, okay. There's nothing about it that is like, wow, we're going to Richmond. So. See, it used to be such a great track. And like. I, this car just does not suit that track at all. And I think that's the biggest problem. Yeah. Sorry, Richmond. <laughs> Hate it for you. But I think it's, I honestly think it's going to go this way. It's going to trend to where everybody, every place only has one date, except for like your big money races like Daytona and Talladega. Yeah. Like a couple I, races like that. 
I think you should have like five crown jewels like Daytona, Talladega, Bristol, Martinsville, and yeah. either Darlington or Charlotte. Even I don't think you like if you're racing at I wouldn't mind Charlotte losing a date and going to Rockingham because if you're going to rock if you're going to Rockingham, I don't think there needs to be two races at Charlotte, one race at North Wilkesboro, one race at Rockingham, two at Darlington, two at Martinsville. I mean, they're all super close, but that's very saturated. I would like to see if we do go to Rockingham, I'd like to see Charlotte, one of Charlotte States or one of Darlington States or something go to, you know, a track that maybe we haven't ran at in a while or something. Like that. But, I think we could lose a Darlington date just for the sole fact, like keep the Southern 500 as the Southern 500. Like even if you move it to earlier in the schedule, it doesn't matter. Um but keep one of the Darlington dates. And then the only reason I say that is just because with Charlotte, you run two completely different configurations of the yeah. track on, you know, the 600 is the oval. And then the Roval is the road course and the oval together. It's like, so you run two different like styles of track. So it's kind of not yeah. really like it. You're having two races. at the, It's not two races of the same thing. I should say. I think that's fine. If you want to have two dates, like Charlotte, for example, and you one run one as a 600, a crown jewel, and you run the other as a robot, I'm fine with that. But, like, I don't think Kansas should have two dates. I don't Absolutely think. Absolutely not. I don't think Phoenix should have two dates. Nope. And people might hate me for this because I know they love going out there, but I don't think Vegas should have two races. Uh, two I dates. don't think so either. Um, so. I don't know, either hit it on the West Coast swing on the way out there or towards the end of the year. But the way that the schedule is now, it's like so random. It's like Homestead, then Vegas, then back again to Martinsville, I think. And it's just like, it's so, and then back out to Phoenix. It's yeah. You make two trips to the West Coast in two, in four weeks. Like yeah. it, that doesn't make any sense. Uh, yeah. I wouldn't mind having like replacing, having those five tracks, keep their two dates, having Kansas lose a date, Phoenix lose a date. Las Vegas lose a date. That's three open races. You know, you can add Kentucky, you can add Rockingham, you can add another road course if you want. I, I'm just spitballing there. Like, I think that would be, you know, you could add Portland if you wanted, you could add Canada if you wanted, you could, um, you know, like I said, you could do a bunch, you could play around with those three dates. And I think that would bring a lot of excitement to some fans for sure. So. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think I think it's trending to the point of every uh like every track is only going to have one date. Yeah. Well, I mean, it look, I think you could keep five like pick five tracks and have those be your crown jewels or whatever and those races deserve two dates, which I think is fine, fair enough to say. I think you should, probably should race at Daytona and Talladega twice a year because of the factor of it. I think Bristol is and Martinsville are two of the most exciting races. So going there twice is fine, especially since they're local. But like, I don't think Atlanta needs two dates. No, no, I don't either. But, you know, it's like if you can't fully fill one track, like one date, you don't need a second date. Like <laughs> Richmond was not <laughs> Richmond was like, OK, attended. But it's like, yeah, you have 50 percent capacity over two races. Well, maybe you could just have one race where it's sold out. Same thing at yeah. Canada. Same thing at Vegas, same thing at Phoenix, you know, so. Yeah, that's no, my, I agree. That's my two cents. I think there's a lot of room to add three tracks. Like, you know, if you take those three races away, you get three options to put, to put stuff. And uh, I think putting like a Rockingham would be awesome for the Cup Series. I think putting, um, you know, a, a Kentucky I keep saying going back to that, but I think that's a track, Kentucky or Chicago land. Or, I would love to go back to Chicago land, but I don't think that's ever going to happen. Or if you even add like, you know, a rate, if you want to add, if you want to expand your market and get to somewhere you have, you're not, you know, you could go to Portland and race cup, or you could go to Canada and race cup. Not saying it's what maybe the best option, but there, there are, there are uh, like, is a cup race at Portland or Canada going to be a better race or okay. than a second Las Vegas race? I don't know. You, Some people are going to say yes. Some people are going to say no. But I at least think having that diversity on the schedule is something that uh, 
is overall good for the sport. And yeah. And at the end of the day, I think it makes a more complete champion, you know, yes. because if you're racing 10 tracks twice, which is about what we do now, mm-hmm. uh, probably, I mean, there's probably 16 races that you're going to go like, you know, eight tracks that you're going to twice. That's 16 races there. So, you know, yeah. if you go to, <laughs> if you go to 30 unique tracks instead of 25 unique tracks, I think that just adds to saying, okay, this person, the the champion at the end of the year was was the most complete driver from A to Z on short tracks, on intermediates, on oval, uh, on super speedways, on road courses. Yeah, but I mean, like, even with your example, if you if you have those eight tracks that we go to twice and that's 16 races, that's almost half your schedule. Right. Tied up in eight racetracks. Yeah. And, like, and that's, that's a little too much. It's the same way, too. Like, you look at the back half of the schedule, Darlington, or it's Richmond, Darlington, Atlanta, Daytona, Talladega, Martinsville, Phoenix, Las Vegas. Um, we only have 10 Bristol. weeks in the season, Bristol. I think the only track that we, the only two tracks that are new from the break on are Watkins Glen and, uh, Homestead. Everything yeah. else is, a, a we've region. raced that earlier this year. Yeah. So I would like to see, even so I would like to see NASCAR diversify that a little bit more. I would like to see maybe, uh, I guess they have to do that because if you have two races at one track, three months apart or whatever, it's. So I don't know. I, I think the solution, like we both agree, is to have more tracks and less tracks have two dates. Um, yeah. We'll see. I mean, NASCAR, it seems like NASCAR is trending in that direction for sure. So, Yeah, we'll see what happens. And uh, I'm, I'm excited for 2025. I hope we can uh, we get a lot of great racing. I know the truck series is going to be even more up in the air because Christian Eckes is going to... Uh, <laughs> he's going to Xfinity and Corey Heim, I think is going to Xfinity as well. So yeah. you, you really don't have a, a flagship driver there anymore. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure somebody will, you know, I mean, Xfinity series is going to be really, really competitive next year. You're going to have, um, well, I guess you're losing Shane Van Gisbergen. Um, yes. and you're losing AJ Allmendinger, but you're yes. adding, you're adding uh, Eckes, Heim, and Zilich, which I think are three of the best prospects in NASCAR. So I also think um, Carson Quapel is going to go to yeah, yeah. Uh, Xfinity as well. Yeah, he's been running really well. Even I th- I'm sure Shane Van Gisbergen and Almendinger and guys are going to come down and run races too, and that's even just going to make it more competitive. So, you know. Um, I think it's really, really going to be an awesome field um, next year in the Xfinity Series. So, yeah, and and with the guys that are in there now, like your Parker Retzlavs, your you know Ryan Sieg's, your your Sam Mayers, your Sheldon Creeds, like those guys, and Jesse Love and stuff like that, like those guys still put on a fantastic show. Best race of the weekend every weekend, like just because yeah. of how on edge they drive those cars yeah yeah i mean austin hill's still going to be there he's going to be really really competitive on uh, super speedways and really any track and um you know jesse love has been good this year has won already so you know the it's going to be it's going to be really good it's going to be really good so yeah i don't know i know we've gone long we've almost ran an hour and 15 minutes but uh We've had a lot to talk about, a lot to catch up on, and uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, like I said, I'm excited for 2025. I hope we can finish off 2024 real strong, and uh, I'm excited to see who's going to win these uh, these championships. I know the truck series. Oh my gosh, man! Between Christian Eckes, Ty Majeski, and Corey Heim, it's going to be a bloodbath to see who's going to win that one. <laughs> yeah, it's going to be amazing. Like I feel like honestly, the truck series championship every year has been like the, the best championship at Phoenix. It's been, it's been close every single time. So yeah. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. So, yeah. so we'll move on to Atlanta this weekend and uh, you're going to be pitting who are you pitting for this weekend. 
This week I'm going to be pitting the 35 uh, Xfinity car, who is uh, May- Mason Maggio is in it this week. And then going to be the 44 Cup car, uh, J.J. Yaley driving it for us. So. Oh, J.J. Yaley. Yep. Wheelman. Yes, and uh, veteran, big time Cup Series veteran, been uh, been doing it for a long, long time. So, yeah, that'll be good. Yeah, knows how to knows how to keep the car clean, and uh, like Joey, I think we'll have a good shot at a at a top twenty five finish at the end of the race. So, yeah, that's awesome. Well, good luck to you, man. I Thank will. Uh, I'll be watching. <laughs> yep. Um, and uh, and yeah, we'll uh, we'll catch back up next weekend or uh, next week. Yep. And uh, where we'll preview Watkins Glen road course. Yep. Talk about Watkins Glen and uh, and see what happened at Atlanta and catch up on all that. That's right. So you be safe, Johnny. Don't get hit out there. And uh, like I said, I'll be watching it at the house. Hopefully everybody enjoys it. And uh, yeah. So we will catch you guys in the next podcast. Till then, you guys be good.